So, I have a confession to make. I'm afraid of crickets. <laughs> they terrify me. And I know where this fear of crickets began. It happened because of the great, uh, the great grasshopper incident of 1973. I was five years old. I was in the front yard of our house in California, hot summer day, and my mom was watering the plants, and she squirted the water in this bush right by me, and this huge six-foot-long grasshopper jumped out of the bush, landed right on my bare leg. I looked down at it, it stared back up at me, gloating, mocking me, and what did I do? Did I swish it away? Did I jump up and down to get off me? No. I froze, I looked up, and I cried. <laughs> Pathetic, I know. We started a new series last week, uh, going through the Minor Prophets. We're taking one Minor Prophet a week, and this week we come to the Prophet Joel. And this has been a traumatic week for me as I've gone through the prophet Joel because I have this P PTSD thing from the dreadful grasshopper incident in 1973. And it turns out the book of Joel is all about grasshoppers. The historical background of the book of Joel is that uh, a great locust plague has just swept through the nation of Israel. There's a, it's a national calamity. It has destroyed all the crops. There's famine happening. There's fires resulting from that, and it's dried up all the rivers, and so there's, there's people they are dying of thirst. It is a national catastrophe, and so Joel uses this national tragedy as a backdrop for a series of prophetic poems in which he asked the question, why? Why did this and other events like it happen? How do we make sense out of suffering and tragedy in our lives and in, our, and in history? That's really the main theme of the book of Joel. And I find it really interesting that we just happen to come to this book of Joel and to this main theme on the anniversary of 9-11. Uh, do you remember where you were on 9-11? I do. I it was a Tuesday. I remember it was a Tuesday because we had our house church gathering that Tuesday night. And we were meeting in the home of a newer Christian. Her name was Heather. And after kind of going through kind of the, the routine and just kind of in a numb state going through the house church kind of stuff, there was a moment of pause and finally Heather asked a question that we all had but we were afraid to ask. Why? Why did this happen? Why did God allow it to happen? Did, did God miss one, she asked? Did Satan get one by on God? The prophet Joel, basically, he asked the same exact question. And as we go through the book of Joel, it's a short three-chapter book, but he really presents three answers to that problem of suffering and evil uh, in the world. And as we, we're going to look at these three answers that Joel uh, suggests uh, as we do, I want you to take note of two things. Number one, in each of his answers he gives, there's this imagery, there's this motif of the day of the Lord. He mentions the day of the Lord. And the second thing is there's this image he gives of the sun turning dark in each of those three answers. Let's take a look. The first uh, answer that Joel uh, gives for this kind of making sense out of suffering and tragedy's problem is that really God uses suffering and calamities. He can use all of that to really... He wants to, to use it to drive us to a place of repentance and brokenness. That really he uses, God uses tragedies to really get our attention. And, uh, and so he, he kind of jumps in and, and he, can, he, he, he records in just poetic form that in chapter one he really describes in majestic poetry. Uh, read it sometime. It's a short book. Take time to read it. It's, it's just majestic language, but describe this horrific event that's just utterly devastated the nation. And then as he gets into chapter two, uh, which is also part of what I had John read, is, is that he then likens this, he still talks about the locust plague, but now he describes them like an, they're like an invading army. And it's at this point, as he describes it as an invading army, that the imagery comes of this first occurrence of this day of the Lord motif and this sun turning to dark imagery. Chapter 2, starting at verse 7. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. Before them the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened. And the stars no longer shine. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. 
Who can endure it? And scholars have noted that actually how Joel describes this and even this poetic language, it perfectly describes what would happen in the ancient world at certain times when locust plagues would sweep through the Middle East and it would, they would appear like this dark cloud just coming across the sky and as it swarmed in, it would literally blot out the sun. It created a darkness in the land. And so Joel describes this, this really horrific scene of this national calamity And then he goes on to call the people of Judah to really use this to to help them, to drive them to the Lord, to a place of repentance and of crying out uh, to God. He says this in chapter 1, verse 14. He says, Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And I think what Joel says should be the function is often the function of calamities. I think it's true that often tragedy in our lives can have this function of really helping to kind of get our focus off of ourselves and, and onto what really matters. It's, it's kind of like water getting splashed in our faces. It kind of it wakes us up. It calls us to attention. And that actually happened in the aftermath of 9-11. Right after 9-11, um, Statistics show church attendance shot up by 25% in the, week, um, in the weeks after 9-11. Uh, it woke up many people, and, and we find that often uh, what tragedies and calamities do, that, that they do, they, they, uh, they wake us up uh, and they, they get our attention. It's a way for God to get our attention, and that is really one of the things that the book of Joel Uh, communicates. Or as Eugene Peterson says in his introduction to the book of Joel, he says that what Joel, Joel offers us the opportunity for a deathbed conversion before the deathbed, when there's still time and space to, to, uh, uh, to set things right and to live more fully to the glory of God. And that happened a bit on 9-11. Unfortunately, after about three weeks, church attendance went right back down to what it was before. It was a superficial repentance. It it, it was an external thing. It didn't get to the heart. And so Joel goes on to say that the repentance that God wants to lead us into, it has to be a real thing. He's not interested in an external form of repentance. He wants your heart. And he goes on to say that in verses 12 and 13. He says, Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He says, rend your hearts, not your garments. In the ancient world, uh, the way that a person would express sorrow over sin was to be actually rip their clothes. They would rend their garments. It was a sign, an external sign of, of either um, mourning over their own sin or, or grieving a loss. But God says, I'm not interested in your external religious performance of repentance. I want the real thing. I want your heart. Rend your hearts, not your garments. And so that's really the first, um, the first answer uh, that, God, that Joel gives, that really God, God uses tragedy to, to get our hearts. To, to, he uses it, it's almost a gift of grace in that way. He, he uses it to get a hold of our hearts. Now the second answer that uh, Joel gives uh, occurs in chapter 3. And here, the, really the central message of Joel is, is that though God can use and does use calamities and tra- tragedies and evil, even things and suf- evil things and suffering in our lives and in history to drive people to himself, that he is not responsible for the evil, he's not the author of evil, and that ultimately those who, who even he uses to bring, uh, bring judgment, he's going to turn around and judge them. And the day is going to come, because he is sovereign Lord of, of all creation, he's completely in control, that one, the day is going to come when he will truly right every wrong. That is what, that's where Joel goes at the end. And he does that in chapter 3, where he actually, after talking about this locust plague for two chapters, he now shifts gear, and he talks about this other great event in Israel's history, how how God used real armies invading Israel to punish Judah for their many sins and the atrocities that Judah had committed. He, he called the Babylonians. He used this empire, the Babylonians, to come in and to, to conquer Judah and to send the exiles out. And he, he used it for a time uh, to do this pruning work. But then 
in Joel and elsewhere, God turns around and judges the very Babylonians that he was using. And this shows this kind of tension of truths of how God is in complete control of history. Uh, he, he is, nothing gets by him. Did, did, did uh, my friend Heather ask, did, God get one, did Satan get one by him? God, no, he's in complete control. And yet, he's not the author of evil. There's, a, there's a something we need to hold in a healthy tension there. The sovereignty of God and yet human freedom to... To, to sin, they're, they're both 100% true. Here's how Joel talks about in chapter 3. He says, In those days, and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial. He's talking about the end of time, really. For what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine to drink. And then verse 13, here comes the judgment. Swing the sickle for the harvest is right. Come, trample the grapes for the wine press is full and the vats overflow so great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision, the sun and moon will be dark and the stars no longer shine. And so there's our second reference to this day of the Lord motif and the sun being darkened imagery. And he brought that judgment on the Babylonians. They were judged in real time in the, in, in the centuries following their conquest, but ultimately it also points to the end of time. That's really the day of the Lord that, that Joel is referring to throughout chapter 3, this future day of the Lord when God truly will be in, bring complete justice to every injustice we see in the world. There's things that happen. We can't explain it. God will one day right every wrong. He will. He will bring an end to all suffering, all tragedy. He will correct, he will end all tragedy and suffering. He will right every wrong. So those are, are kind of two of the answers that Joel gives to this problem of suffering and tragedy. But the third answer is the most important. The third and final answer is the cross. And there are some significant hints to the cross in chapter 2 of Joel where again, we're going to see he's, he's going to talk about the day of the Lord again. There's another day of the Lord reference, and there's a third sun turned to darkness imagery. And it begins in chapter 2, uh, verse 18, in which really, after describing this horrific locust plague and, and the tragedy that that has happened now, uh, it's going to shift, and it's going to talk about the Lord's response, how he's going to bring hope. He's going to bring deliverance out of this incredible tragedy. He's going to bring, he's going to bring hope. He's going to bring uh, healing to the land, but Joel's going to show what he's really talking about. This future day of the Lord, when God does that, it points to something specifically. We're going to see that in just a moment, but here's how he begins. Verse 18, Then the Lord was jealous for the land and took pity on his people. And then jumping down to verse 25, he speaks of this coming day, this day of the Lord, when I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. And what is this particular Day of the Lord that he's referring to? Here it is, verse 28. And afterward, literally in that day, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Does that sound familiar? After Jesus died on the cross about 400 years later, dying in our place, he rose again from the dead and he ascended into heaven. And then this happened, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then a crowd begins to form. And then this verse 11, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, 
made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine, they're drunk. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what the prophet Joel said. Uh, this was what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, uh, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your only will dream dreams. And he goes on to quote this exact same passage that I just quoted from the book of Joel and ending where verse 20, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And Peter would go on from there in this very first sermon to this crowd that day to tell them about how this day of the Lord has happened as Jesus hung on the cross. It was the day of the Lord. It was the day that the sun turned dark, that the world went dark. And, and that event of the cross is described in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 23, verse 44 says this. It was, about, it was now about noon. And darkness came over the whole land as Jesus is on the cross until three in the afternoon. It's the middle of the day for the sun stopped shining and the curtain in the temple was torn in two. It was the day of the Lord that day. And, and this is what the, the, the locust and the prophet Joel pointed to uh, for, uh, for all the, uh, for the, for the locusts were swarming that day as Jesus hung on the cross the day of the Lord. The locusts were, were swarming and they blotted out the sun. And on that day, Jesus had an answer for the out locusts. He absorbed them. The locusts that day, that what, what blotted out the sun that day, it was our sin. It was, it was the, every evil thought, every evil action of every human heart. That's what was swarming through the sky that day, that day of the Lord blotting out the sun. And every single one of them fell upon Jesus. Jesus endured the day of the Lord. He took the judgment day of the Lord so that for us that day could truly be a good day, a new day. A day when... God would, as Joel says, repay us for the years the locusts have eaten. Let me close by coming back to my Tuesday house church on that fateful 9-11 day. Heather asked the question, what happened here? Why did God allow this to happen? Did, did Satan get one by him on God? Where was God when this happened? Uh, did, why did God allow this to happen? I'll tell you how I answered it. I, I gave her an immediate answer. I did not hesitate. I said, Heather, you, you don't know the half of it. You're not questioning God enough. The real question is not how can God, how could allow, God allow these 3,000 tragic deaths to occur? The real question is how could God allow any death to occur in the first place? 10 out of 10 people die. There's 7 billion people on the planet. In the next 80, 90, 100 years, there's going to be 7 billion deaths that's a staggering statistic. Seven billion deaths, and God is going to allow every single one of them to happen, including your own. Why? The book of Joel gives us the answer, and the answer is this. Though life is short and is very unfair and unjust for most people in the world. God has a plan he is sovereign, he is in control, and ultimately that plan played itself out in Joel chapter 2, this pointing to the day of the Lord, the work of the cross, in which God provided through that work of the cross a pathway to, to a life beyond this life. If this life is all there is, then there's no answer to this question of, of, of suffering and injustice in the world, but if there's a life to come that God is preparing, and he has prepared the way through the cross, through that day of the, the Lord, uh, so that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, just think about that word, saved. We use that word a lot. We kind of throw out around this word, saved. What does it mean to be saved? Well, it means this, that like the Twin Towers, those many years ago now, sin, uh, uh, the world is on fire. Sin and evil has crashed into us. Into, sorry, sin and evil has crashed into the world and its foundations are melting and it's soon gonna, gonna collapse and we're in the, the building and, and it's just a matter of time before it goes down. The world's on fire, it's gonna come down. 
but a rescue worker, Jesus, his name, has rushed into the building. He extends his arm, and he says, take my hand, I know a way out. That analogy, though, breaks down because on that day, those 3,000 uh, deaths, were, they were innocent victims, but we're not innocent victims. In a sense, you could say we are really responsible for the, for the blaze, and so, so maybe it's more like this. Sin and evil has crashed into us. We are the Twin Towers, and we are going to collapse inward upon ourselves. Uh, and, and so the call is to invite Christ to come into our very lives and extinguish the flames. He's, his blood shed on the cross will do that. It will extinguish the flames as we invite him in, and then he goes to work as he begins to rebuild the foundations of our lives through his Holy Spirit, who now indwells us, thus completely saving us. And the prophet Joel essentially says the same thing. Three things in chapter two, he says, rend your hearts and not your garments. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the gospel according to Joel. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. There's no easy answer to this question of evil and suffering. We just barely touched on it, but, but we would allow what you have given us, these answers in the book of Joel, to, we would respond to them. That Number one, Lord, would you allow us to, to, to when there, there are struggles in our lives, tragedies, things we can't explain, let, help us to let it drive us to you and, and crying out to you and through repentance and brokenness. And, and, and Lord, give us the hope and the assurance that one day you are going to right every wrong. Give us that confidence and may we place our hope not in this world but in the world to come when you do bring complete justice and, and Lord, would you help us to fix our eyes on the cross where you finish the work and you pave the way such that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord may be saved. We call on the name of the Lord. Save us, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen.